re response is that it gives us uh, an index of how the brain or the specific uh, sources of, of activity, how they uh, compute the a model for the environment of what, what is regular, okay, and how they determine what is irregular. Okay, so we, I don't have to say too much to uh, convince you that this is really a rich uh, ground for, for studying uh, things that have <coughs> to do with these kinds of uh, regularity and deviation and predictions and prediction errors and so on. So that's one thing, but the other thing is that it allows us to figure out which type of information uh, the we, we process without paying attention to the stimuli. Okay? So, so both on both sides of this equation, uh, there is a lo there is a lot that can be uh, that can be studied that can be learned from this mismatch negativity. And in fact, over the years, people have used it to uh, probe numerous uh, features of the sounds, starting from very simple like uh, the sound frequency and its duration, and its intensity and location and timbre and the, ph and the phonetic content. And, and more and more complex uh, information. Um, for example, right now in my, in, in my lab, uh, Tamar is, is asking whether we automatically um, uh, form a model or detect a regularity in the chroma of tones. Chroma is the, the musical notes. Okay? So she, is present, she presents to, this, to the subject a series of the same note, but in different octaves, so very different frequencies. Think about the piano and the, 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 the tone C si or Do, as we, as we say it in Hebrew or in Latin. Uh, and, but it's presented in different octaves, so it's very, very di the sounds are very, very different, but there is one thing that is common to them. They're all the note C, okay, in mu musically. And then occasionally there is another note, say uh, uh, C or La or whatever, one of the other notes is presented among these, these tones, and it's also very different from the other tones in frequency. So if we only, if we only process the basic frequencies of the sound, nothing should be irregular about this odd sound. But if we do detect the fact that all of these sounds were the same note do, then we would get a mismatch negativity, right? So, so that's the kind of a question you, you can ask with this uh, type of um, type of type of analysis. I can tell you that although in really numerous features are detected, chroma is probably not detected automatically. You needed to pay attention so in order to know which, which tone it is. Um, but um, it's aside, from, aside from these um, basic uh, features of the sound, or not so basic features, uh, there is, um, oh sorry, I'll jump, I'll jump ahead here. There, there are um, examples of Detecting regularity on a very, in a much higher level, um, my higher level proce processing. One nice, nice example is the fact that um, over, over the develop, over development, we 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 uh, form categories of phonemes. Okay? So um, as we learn our language, we learn that some phone some utterances belong together to the same phoneme. So even though I pronounce, you know, my B uh, at a certain uh, way and you pronounce the B in a slightly different way, we all know that it's the same, letter, the same phoneme that we try to, to express, B or B, okay? Now, what, what you see here is, is an experiment in which they presented different vowels to uh, a group of Finnish and a group of Estonian uh, participants. Now, it turns out that there are some, uh, some phonemes that uh, are exist as entities in uh, Finnish but not in Estonian. So the ö uh is a distinct phoneme in, in, in Finnish but not in, 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 Esto in Estonian. Okay? Um, now for me, all these, all these vowels sound exactly the same. I happened to be in, in, in Finland when they did this experiment or one of these experiments and in the background, I kept hearing like, uh, 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 it all sounded exactly, exactly the same. Apparently, there was some deviance in these sequence of sounds. But what you, what you see here, this is just the, the, um, the amount of negativity and the mismatch negativity. 
And what, what you see is that for the sins, this is, a, this is different. It, uh, it elicits the mismatch negativity, but not for the Estonians. Okay? Even though it's a very same, very, very same sound. Acoustically, it's the same difference. If you measure it, you can, find, you can see it. But for the Estonians, they just see it as, as belonging to the, cat, to the regular category, not, to, not as a deviant. The other key, key, uh, neat thing that you can show with this is that with babies, initially in very in infants, as they are born, they show mismatch negativity for whatever uh, difference that you make. Any acoustic difference will create a mismatch negativity, but as they learn the language, some differences disappear. They don't hear them anymore because they they group them together into a category. So that just shows you what kind of things you can uh, you can ask with uh, this kind of, of a feature. Okay. Um, this is one of our studies where we uh, asked uh, whether we automatically uh, localize sounds even when we don't pay attention. Okay, so I have this, uh, this um, phenomenon which I'm sure you're all familiar with that my, my, my phone rings and I start going like this, like where is it? Okay, which suggests that maybe we d I simply don't register the location before I turn my attention and look, and look, for, this, look for the sound. But it turns out that we definitely do, uh, do localize sounds. And th what you see here is the response to changes of 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees of, s of the sound. So a series of sounds comes from one location, and then occasionally it deviates by a certain de amount of degrees. And you see that not only do we detect the difference, but it follows the amount of difference between the regular sounds and, and the other sounds. Um, um, <coughs> so th this is this is ju these are just uh, a couple of examples. Um, y I'll just say that you can uh, show that with mismatch negativity that we detect regularities in abstract features. So, for instance, if I present pairs of tones, one low and one higher, a low tone and a high tone, but the frequencies of these tones varies from one present one pair to the other. So they can be both relatively low or both relatively high. The only thing that is regular is the fact that the second is higher than the, than the first. And then occasionally I switch and present first the high and then the low, you would get the mismatch negativity. So that's an, like an abstract feature that we see. Okay, so this is, this is the mismatch negativity, a very uh, simple paradigm which yields very, very rich um, data. Now, I'm going now into the more endogenous potentials, the ones which really uh, rely on the task that you're doing. Um, and those are uh, usually uh, later, in, uh, later in time, as, uh, you'll, as you'll see, they're usually more prolonged, they're not as sharp as the evoked potentials, and their latency might vary much, much more than the early potentials, which is, makes sense, right? Because we need processing, and there's a variability between, uh, between subjects in the way we we do the task and so on, okay? <coughs> so I'll start with, with this uh, target detection <coughs> and, and orientation. And here, the most, probably the, the most uh, used paradigm in, in uh, cognitive psychology, the oddball paradigm, which is very similar actually to the one that I just presented with the mismatch negativity, because here too, there is a, a regular event like this small blue circle which appears on the screen one after the other, not in a series, like, not like this, but one after the other. There's, a, there's this blue circle. And then occasionally there is a larger circle and the subject is required to detect it, to press the button or to count the number of big circles, to do something about these big circles. So that, this one we'll call the target. But and occasionally you might actually, uh, you might also introduce into this sequence another odd stimulus, which the subject does not have to do anything with. Okay, so that's not a target, but it's still very different from, the re from most, of, most of the stimuli. So this one we'll call the, a distractor. Okay? So both the target and the distractor are rare events, but one requires an action, the other one actually requires to suppress an action, or, or not to do anything about it. Um, and then what we see when we, when we analyze the responses to the standards, the, tunder, the, the targets and the, and the distractors, is that we get two, uh, two positive responses, the P3A and the P3B. Okay? The P3B is known uh, to some people as the P300 um, 
probably the, the most famous ERP, ERP. okay? But we, the, it's called P300 because the initial uh, description by Sutton and others was in a specific paradigm using auditory stimuli and in their hands the P3 appeared at 300 milliseconds. So they called it the P300. But as I said, said last time, it's better not to be adhere so much to the la specific latency because then if you do it in a visual paradigm or it's other subjects or the, the, the target is more rare and so on, the, the latency changes. So we'll call it P3A and P3B. Okay. Um, the other, two, the other things I'll show you in a second is that the P3A is more, uh, is more frontal and the P3B is more parietal in distribution on the scalp, not in the brain, on the scalp. You see it's more frontal or more parietal. Um, there's also indication that the P3A is related more to uh, dop dopamine release, whereas the P3B is related more to nor 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 uh, noradrenaline or norepinephrine uh, re release. And last, is that the P3A is associated with the distractor and the P3B is elicited by the target. Okay. Uh, sorry. I'm not sure if I totally understand this, but I mean, if I, I switch uh, the, uh, uh, I, I use the target as the distractor, but I use the distractor as the target, mm -hmm. well, why is it the same event? What you'll see is that now, since this is now the distractor, yeah, it will yeah. elicit the P3A. And okay. since this is now a target, it will elicit the P3B, okay. even though you didn't do anything to the stimuli. That's the nice thing. That exactly expresses the fact that it's an endogenous potential. So although you didn't change anything not in the sequence and didn't change anything in the stimuli, the response changes because the subject treats these stimuli differently. Okay? Yeah. Does P3A um, respond only target or only the P3A uh, will, will be a response to, to the distractor. It's, there is a question of whether it is hidden within the P3B as well. So you have both, both responses. Probably, yes. Probably you see the P3A and P3B, but it's, they're, hid, they're, they're kind of a one big mess. Yeah. Because they're separate in space? Yeah. So here's the, so here is the, um, here, here's what they, lo what they look like. Okay. So, uh, this is a response to, to um, forget, okay, forget about the single stimulus. It's something related to this specific uh, study. But this is the, these are the oddball, uh, par this is an oddball paradigm. And so if we just have standards and targets, this is the response to the standard, this is the response to the target, and you get a P, a, what they call here a P300, but we should call it a P3B. Okay? So that's a P3B. Now, if you have a three stimulus paradigm where you have standards and target, but occasionally also a deviant, then you get uh, a P3B for the target and a P3A for, for the distractor. Okay? And the, the P3A is earlier, and as I said, it's more frontal than, than, the, than the target response. Okay? Um, so this, the, 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 the P3A is considered to be an orienting response. Something happened that I need to, to to take care of, maybe it's, it requires my attention. Okay, so it's an orienting response, and some people call it the novelty P3A, okay, or novelty P3. And the target, the target response, the oddball, that's a big question. What exactly are we seeing? Why do we see this big, big response? Um, and one of the models which people cite uh, frequently is that what happens, the, the reason that we see this big response is that since we detected the target, which we were, we, we were waiting for, we were holding in working memory the target we're and waiting for it to appear, and now it appeared, then there is, a, there is a, this kind of a updating of working memory. I'm updating my working memory, and that's what I see uh, as the P3B. But I don't want to commit too much to the cognitive explanations. It's definitely a simplistic, uh, a sim simplistic explanation, especially that uh, there, is, um, there are a lot of sources, I'll just say in a second. Um, this, uh, this, is, um, this is actually the, the study which collected different, um, different sources of information regarding the sources, the neural sources of the P3A and the P3B. Uh, and since it's, a, it's, it's such a popular component to use, there have been many, many studies trying to figure out what is happening in the brain when you see the P3B and the P3A. And what, did, what they collected here is uh, bold responses, fMRI, 
which cannot say that they, st they studied the P3A or the P3B because they're using both responses, right? But the paradigm is such that allows you to associate it with either a distractor or a target, okay? So these are the, um, these are the white and the black dots, okay? Um, then the, um, the, 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 the uh, contours, the white and black contours show, show you uh, results from lesions from lesion studies, patients who had brain lesions and showed reduction or enhancement of, of the P3A or P3B. So these are, uh, these are the, the, the white and the black contours. And then the shading, you see sometimes you see like a white shading over here or a black shading over here. These are uh, um, data from intracranial recordings from ECO, okay, where patients had actually electrodes over their brains. Uh, for, for sur before, sur before epileptic surgery. Um, and by and large, what, what you can see is that there is a, quite a big overlap between uh, the P3A and the P3B response, okay? Um, but it's not, a com it's, not a complete, it's not a complete overlap, okay? So there's, uh, there's some dif differences uh, be between these conditions. For example, uh, with the, with, the, with the bold, we see responses in the hippocampus for the P3B, but not from, for the, from the P3A. Okay, so uh, questions about the P3? Yeah. Um, what's the probability of a single instance like a single digit? It's very clear to tell if it's like P3A or P3B, or only like on the, like the traces you got are obviously from the Over average, average. right. But the brain itself like doesn't have doesn't wait an hour to average the signal. Exactly. So, right. um, so, I don't know if you remember that last last uh, were you here last week. Yeah. So I showed a, I showed a uh, slide uh, explaining uh, the question of how many trials do you need to average in order to see something. And one of my w one of the examples was the P3B. Okay. So, so with the, with both of these components are pretty large. Okay, there are some of the largest components that, that we get. They could be tens of microvolts sometimes, as opposed to the mismatch negativity, which is between one and two microvolts. Okay, so it's it's relatively big, and sometimes you can see it in single trials. Okay, but usually not. However, we you definitely respond on on a single trial basis, right? As you said, your brain responds, and using more sophisticated tools uh, like classification, um, you can get. Uh, what to me was amazingly good results by trying to classify. So we, we have, uh, um, we have, a, we have a, a tool that, that does the classification exactly on this kind of a target, de target detection and you can get to very, very high classification of single trials. Uh, so definitely the response is single trial. You can't usually many times see it on the waveform, but you can see it if you look more globally. Um, Okay, and the, another couple of, of uh, components that I'm uh, going to, to mention. Um, one has to do with, with object, recogni object recognition. And that is uh, a little bit odd because I'm, going, I'm, I'm trying to talk about endogenous components and this is actually an evoked response, okay? But I put it in this, in this um, context because we see here a response which depends on uh, more elaborate processing on, on categorization. Specifically, the, this is the response called the N170, which is actually uh, a variation of the N1, of the visual N1. So I, t we, I told you last, last week that the, when you show visual stimulus, you get a P1 response and then an N1 response. And it turns out that when you uh, show a face rather than many other objects, you get a response, an N1 response, which is bigger and also has a little bit of a different topography. Okay, so it, it is more lateral in the scalp than uh, all these other responses. Its maximum is more lateral. So this is a face, a face sensitive N170, um, and it's probably the most studied and one of the very few components which you can say that are very selective for a specific category uh, of stimuli. We don't have so many. Uh, responses like this, which are uh, very sensitive to, to, a specific, to a specific category. That doesn't mean uh, that our brain doesn't respond differently to other categories as well. I mean, there might be 
um, clusters of neurons which respond specifically to butterflies or to flowers or to cars or to or to words. There probably are, okay, these clusters. But for some reason, uh, we it's very hard to to see them uh, when we when we record in the skull. One possible reason might be that uh, faces are more uh, preserved over subjects. So uh, subjects have a very similar response to faces, but may have a more variable response to the other categories. So when I try to, f to find these specific responses, it always, always requires averaging over subjects, and then if, it's, if there's more variability, it will look like there is no specific component uh, for the other categories, but there is one uh, for, the, for the faces. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, this you can see this here. Um, so the the the, the, comp the, comp the negativity is is red here in this kind of in this drawing, and you're looking at the head from above. You see the, the nose over here. Okay. So this is the top the typical topography of the N170 with negativity here on the, the on the two sides and more positivity over here. Uh, the responses to, to the non to the non uh, uh, to the re the regular N1. If I just show a checkerboard like I showed last week, or, or, or if I show other other uh, categories, then the N1 will be uh, smaller, and its neg this negativity will be much more central. So the, it will be it will move from here to here. It will be over here. It's hard to see in this one, but it's usually like over here and over here. So um, this has, of course, been a, a, a case for many, many studies trying to merge what we know from, the, for instance, the fusible face area and, and N170. Currently, it looks like the N170 is not a manifestation of the, F, of the FFA. It doesn't come from the FFA. It's probably for more lateral sites that are sensitive to faces, maybe the occipital face area, okay, which is another of these blobs that you see in fMRI. Uh, but it's, it's not... Uh, straightforward to, to make the comparison, okay? Um, okay, um, remember what did I say about this? I'm going to skip some. Uh, some there's there, the, the other component I'm going to show, to talk about is, um, is the N400, okay, which is, which is uh, a component which was first described regarding linguistic information. So any, w any of you who are interested in, in language and especially in, se in le the lexical and semantic part of language, this is um, a dissection tool for you. Um, the, the, the intriguing phenomena that was described by Martha Kutas and, and, and her, her students was the following. So you have a sentence, like it was his first day at work, okay? And you have sentences like, he spread the warm bread with socks. Okay? The difference between them be is obviously the fact that this last word was expected here, it was is unexpected over here. Okay? And imagine I had another, another sentence which also ended with socks, but it was expected. Okay? So I put on my shoes and socks. Okay? Or I would have something that w where work would be unexpected. So every word could be expected or unexpected. And then I, compare, I look at the ERPs, and in this particular drawing, they showed, it's usually not done, but they show here the, the responses to the whole sentence. So you can see the response to each, each word. These are auditory. They're presented orally in this case, but they could just as well be presented visually. It doesn't matter. And what, you, what I want to point out is the difference between the purple line, which is the response to the, to the expected word, to the sentence with the expected word, and the dotted the broken line, the blue broken line, which is the response to the unexpected word. And here negativity goes up. Okay? So when the word is unexpected, you get a bigger response over here. This is about 300 to 500 milliseconds after the stimulus was heard. And therefore it was called the N400 because it peaks around 400 milliseconds. 
And the interesting thing is that over the years, people have tried many manipulations in trying to see when we, what actually makes the N400 smaller or bigger. And look at this, for example. Okay, so what I showed you be before was the sentence final. Okay, this is the last word in the, in the, last word in the sentence. Bigger and for more, uh, more negative N400 for the, for the uh, incongruent or unexpected word. Okay, that's what we just saw. If, it's, if the sentence, if the word, unexpected word is within the sentence, expected or unexpected, you get the same thing. Okay, the bigger N400 uh, for the unexpected. If, for instance, you show, uh, you just use a repetition of words. So either you present the same word twice or two different words, and you look at the response to the second word. So one is repeated and one is unrepeated. You would get a bigger N400 for the repeated for the unrepeated word. Okay. Even more interesting maybe is if I just take words, single words, and I choose words which are frequent in the language, that you can kind of hear them every day, or words which are rare. You maybe have read them three times in your life, or, or okay, you, know, you, you may uh, hear them uh, at some arcane radio shows. And I, pr I, I compare the responses to these two words, you get a bigger, a bigger uh, response to the rare word. Okay. So altogether, what would you say the N400 may? What what might it uh, represent? Hmm? What? A, a what? Prediction error. Prediction that would ex. Hmm? Pardon. Okay, so that that would explain very well, I think, uh, the, the where it's when it's within se within sentence within sentences or uh, or or, um, or or in the sentence final. It's I'm not sure exactly about the repetition. Uh, if you have like half of the words are repeated and half of the words are unrepeated, um, or if it's a word frequency, it's not exactly that I expect the specific words. Uh, Hmm? Frequency might 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 be thought of as, as expectation. I agree. Uh, what else can we, can? We hmm? But how would that explain? How would that explain the word the word final, for instance? Um, where is it? The word here. What? How would you just it? Don't expect to uh, to have such words in this context in this uh, in in sentences that are formed in a similar way. So Uncommon, so you react more. And again, with your okay, but uncommon that you react more, you're just describing the, the phenomenon. What about what kind of cognitive process, what kind of computation? Familiarity. Hmm? Familiarity. Familiarity, that is good for the frequency, but it's not, you know, the socks, I, I can, you know, socks are as familiar if I present them within. Familiarity within a context. Oh, familiarity within a context. So, okay, so you're saying that we somehow make a, a note of how f how familiar we are with this kind of sentence, the, the whole context? Not the, not the exact sentence, but yes, I think that there may be like related semantic fields that we are familiar with and ready when we feel the sentence. If you expect so, so something from a general group, Okay, so one, one, so one thing that I think was, was in both of your explanations is that there is something definitely about the context. Okay, so what we, what we see here is that when we, and this was the first message that Mata Kutas wanted to, uh, to convey in her studies, was that when we process a word, we don't process it in isolation. So it's we, the way we process it in very early, I mean, this is 300, 400 up to milliseconds after the word has been pro pro produced or seen, the way we process it already depends on the context in which we are. We are okay, and the sentence, for instance, the sentence, the word that came before has set a context for the processing of this word. Now you can think of it as a prediction error, as as, as you suggested. We, what, you want to say something else? Yes, I'm not clear about the repeated and unrepeated. Mm -hmm. The experiment just you can uh, you can have words which are repeated, which we, uh, so the. the the critical word that you're looking at the M400 for is other, uh, has either been repeated, so it's the second time that you hear the word in a row, okay, yeah. or the word before was a different word, okay? Yeah. And we've seen before that there are 
similar spikes also for like visual theory or sound, like when sort of predicts an error like in general. So is it obvious that all of these instances are like the same exact spike, or maybe they're also like a bit different or like it's a good it's a good it's a very good question. I don't have a good a clear a conclusive answer, but I can say that it what seems to be the case is that in many situations, either with words or there's some we're here like line drawings, okay, if I do the same but instead of with the final word I present a drawing, okay, or uh, in, our, in, in our experiments when we presented scenes in which there was an odd, uh, odd object, so we replaced it, there's somebody playing a violin and we you know, worked in Photoshop and replaced the violin with a broom, okay. So the, the, the scene with the, with the incongruent stimulus uh, produced a bigger N400 uh, than the uh, congruent scene, and they all did with the same kind of topography and more or less in the same latency range. Okay, so I cannot vouch for the fact that it's all exactly the same response, but it's the same cognitive manipulation seems to be, and it's the same topography and same latency, which the three of those those make a component. And it's unique for semantics. Okay, so, so that's, that's a an important thing. So continuing our discussion from before, that it seems to be that the N400 has to do something with the meaning, okay, with the, sem with, with the semantics of, of the information, or if, if it's in, in language, it, it might be lexical, okay? And, uh, yeah, please. So yeah, you can you can you can always you know the predictions can be Im implemented by a type of, of adaptation. So it could be the it could be the mechanism, and that would go along with, with what I was uh, going to say, is that people have thought about this as uh, lexical or semantic search. Okay. So when I pr when I'm presenting with a word, I need to uh, look for its meaning. So the way I, I would look for its lexical entry to find it as a word and then would extract the, me the meaning of the word. Now if the word is expected, what this shows is that I the expectation uh, allows me for like a free search. And I can, always I can get the, 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 um, the, the, the what people have called the logo, logo again, the, 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 the pattern of activity that is typical of this word. I can, actually, I can get it a little bit more activated in advance because I know it's coming. So I should. Why should I wait? Okay. So I get it prepared. Whereas when I when I don't know what's coming or when I have a, an un, an unexpected word, I need to start from scratch. I need to start from scratch, looking in my library library for the uh, for for the um, for the, the lexical entry and for and for its meaning. So the bigger N four hundred in, in this uh, kind of explanation represents the the longer, more intense uh, in lexical or semantic search. And there's been many, many debates about whether it's lexical or semantic that I'm not even uh, sure I understand uh, all, all of these nu nuances of, of, the, of, the, of the studies. Uh, but people were willing to tear each other's hair from, for the question of whether it's semantic or lexical or something like that. But this is the kind of question that you can ask with, with, with your piece by clever manipulations. So altogether, I would say that if you want to, like a, um, um, a s simple, ex simple description of what elicits the N400, whenever you have some kind, something which is semantically unexpected, you would get a bigger N uh, N400. <coughs> okay, yeah. Yes, th th that's actually an important point. So in all of these, in the initial experiments that were done with N400, there was always something about expectation. You build an expectation through a sentence or through... A he, what this says, shows, is that it's not, ne it's not a necessary condition for eliciting the N400 to have some kind of a, a context. Okay? It's enough to present 
stimuli which are harder to to understand, okay? Because they're rare, okay? Or because they weren't primed by previous words, okay? And so, and so on. Now, another thing that tells you that this is not specific, not just, just uh, an audible response. Some one of you uh, suggested similarity between this and division of negativity, for instance. So. For, to, to show that this is not a simply an audible re response, uh, they, what they did is to also uh, use dif differences which are not semantic. For example, it could be a, a visual difference, like the word would be in bigger font, okay? Or it could be a, a lexical, unex lex uh, sorry, a syntactically unexpected word. So uh, the, the in Hebrew, for instance, it could be a, a sentence starting with, with, a, with, a, fe with a feminine, and then the, the, the last word would unexpectedly be masculine. Okay? Or it could start with the plural and then you, you present something which is odd because it's in, in the singular at the end. Okay? It won't cause... No, it's, this won't cause an N400. In, on just the opposite, it would cause uh, this P, P500 or P600 the positivity in this l later positivity. Very systematically, there's a very big difference between semantic incongruity and syntactic incongruity. And there are other components which I'm not mentioning today because they're too uh, specific that if you're interested that you can look at that are sensitive to specific syntactic uh, deviations. Okay, so, so it's, what, what I wanted you to take home from this is that the ERPs are like a crude measure. We, you remember the, my analo analogy of the football, of the soccer game, and you're standing outside and you're just listening to the crowd, but if you do the right, uh, the right experiment, you can use the responses to, um, to, make, to, to get in very interesting conclusions about stages of processing uh, that, that you're targeting here. Okay. So we already talked about the about about attention, right? So and I want to go on to uh, our so one more thing that I want to show. So up to now, we talked about um, we talked about the time domain. We we looked at how potentials evolve within until now, specific electrodes over time, and we looked for differences in the amplitude of, of, the, com of the components. Um, but you can also um, decompose the, the time series into their spectral uh, parallels. Okay, so you can move from the time domain to the, to the, frequency, to the frequency domain, and in some cases this can be uh, pretty useful, I'm sure. For most of you, I don't need to talk about how you do this, you know, Fourier transform or wavelets. Um, if anyone needs more explanation, then we can uh, go over it later. But the important thing is that over the, over, um, over the years, especially in the clinics, uh, this uh, frequency domain was even more, u more uh, um, used than the time domain. So you, people divide the EEG into different bands like the delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. The reason for the names is just the order in which they were described. So you, you will notice that there is no systematic uh, uh, movement, movement here. Um, but the, these, are, these are bands which tend to kind of uh, change together in different, in different situations. I also already showed you the alpha band which already Berger saw with his uh, initial recordings, and I also showed you the alpha activity in my, in my student in this movie last, last time. Now, to, to, look, to, um, to look at more uh, cognitive components in, in, the sp in the temporal domain, we need to do something which is kind of like ERPs, but in, in, the, in, the, temporal, in, the, in the spectral domain. And for that, um, people have been, have been using th something called time frequency decomposition, which means that you have um, some waveform in time and you want to look at, this, at the spectral content, but not overall, but specifically over time, okay? So the way to do it is to basically um, have this kind of frequency by time plot and then run a window over, over this waveform. So you take a window and you run it over, over the waveform and for each time point that you move, you compute the spectrum. So each line, each line, each column, sorry, of this uh, of this um, um, 
image represents a spectrum at one given point. Okay, so this is one spectrum, another spectrum, and you, you put them together, you get this nice, uh, colorful time frequency plot, which has become uh, the, the target of, of many studies in, in recent years. Uh, there's many, there are several ways of doing it. You can either use this window and run a run, uh, running Fourier uh, transform, or you can do it with, a wa with wavelets. Um, so these are different filters. Uh, what's common to them is that they have the same number of cycles, but as you can see, lower frequencies have longer windows and higher frequencies are, have narrow win narrower windows and you do the same, you run it over. So this is a hand waving frequency decomposition. Um, and using this kind of a time frequency res responses, um, you can start asking whether specific frequencies at specific times vary as a as a function of the um, experimental manipulation. And this is a very famous example that I'm going to uh, tell you later, which is that it's a mistake, but it's a famous, uh, famous result which illustrates nicely the way this is, this is done. So you have two uh, different objects. The subject, subjects have seen either Kanitsa triangle, or you all see the triangle, right? Or if you just uh, do the same thing and have the same stimuli but rotate these pacmans so it's visually very very similar with the only difference is that in one you see a coherent object and in one you don't and if you if, if, if you look at this this window over here you see that when you see a triangle either because it's really there or because there is an illusory contour form you get a big activation at this uh, gamma band feature okay from 30 hertz and up around 300 milliseconds but if you rotate the Pac-Man, this activity is much, much smaller. Okay? So this is uh, a, a type of response that you might connect to things like binding. Okay? Whenever you have a binding or you, you create a coherent object, you get an increase in the power of gamma around 300 milliseconds after the, the time of, of, uh, of appearance of the object. And then you can plot where exactly on the scalp you see this effect. And you see that it's over here, over here over occipital, occipital varietal skull. Okay. So don't take it as a fact because as I said, this turned out to be an, an artifact later, but it still is a good example of how uh, this thing is done and should be done, except for if it's an artifact. But it's, but so if it is saying, I have to take a break, okay? So, so this is exactly the right time to do the, take a break, okay? I forget, you know, how to film, there are no breaks. People just stop. ‫שלמה, <laughs> לא, אפילו במשמש נספקטיביטי. איך אני יכולתי לדעת אם הנבקים שלי מפענחים את המיקום, מיקום של הצליל בלי קשב? אם אני אבקש מהם להקשיב, אז... דברים כאילו, אני לא אז לפעמים יש ולפעמים אין. אני יכול, אפילו עכשיו יש לנו שתי דוגמאות ממש טובות במעבדה שמראות שבלי לעשות ירפיז לא היינו מגיעים למסקנות כאלה. יש עוד, למשל המסקנה של מרתה קוטה סימה N400, העובדה שאנחנו... כשאנחנו מפרחים מילה, אנחנו כבר עושים את זה בקונטקסט של המשפט. אז יש פרחים. יש פרחים, אבל הניסויים של עם הבנק, שהוא יכול להיות... לא, אז בפריימינג את לא יודעת, את לא יודעת, בפריימינג את לא יודעת בסופו של דבר מתי בדיוק קרה האפקט. האם זה קרה כשהוא היה רטרואקטיבי, או שבזמן הפענוח של המילה. את יכולה לחשוב על זה שאחרי ששמעת את כל המשפט, את אומרת, אוקיי, עכשיו אני אעשה אינטגרציה 
של כל המשפט, כן? ועכשיו אני אראה אם המילה הזאת הייתה נכונה או לא נכונה, ואז זמן התגובה שלי יושפע מזה. אז יש לו, אני יכול לתת לך עוד, באמת, זה, זה לא קשה לי למצוא דוגמאות שמראות ש-ERP תורמים, אבל כמדד התנהגותי, זה לא יגיד לך שום דבר על המוח. זאת אומרת, אם הייתי מודד סקין קונדקטים של פונס, זה היה נכון, זה בחלק מהמקרה, לקבל תשובה, לקבל תשובה. זה לא אומר שזה, זה שזה בהמון, זה מקרה. כן, זה מקרה, כי שם נעשה העיבוד. אבל זה לא אומר שום דבר על המון. וזה הכוח העיקרי, זה הכוח העיקרי של ERP. אבל, זה בא מהמון, כן? אז זה כל מיני שיטות של converging evidence יחד, שזה יפה מראה, יחד עם זה שעושים בזהירות רבה, שלוש לוקליזיישן. אם יחד עם העובדה שזה כן נותן לך את האפשרות להגיד מתי דברים קרו, יותר מכל שיטה אחרת, כן? כמה מוקדם בתהליך, אני חושב משהו כזה או אחר, אז זה אני יכול להפסיק איפה זה קרה בתהליך העיבוד. אז זה נותן לי גם מידע יותר ספציפי על המוח ואיך שלבים בין דברים אחר עובדים. מה, למשל מה? למשל, זה למשל, למשל לגבי הזמן, את יכולה, אני יכול לשאול עם הסצנות האלה שהצגנו, שהיו קונגרואנטיות ולא קונגרואנטיות, אז השאלה היא, האם ה-incongruent הזה זה דבר שקורה מאוחר, אחרי שתפסתי כבר את כל הסצנה ואני עושה איזו אינטגרציה של כל האובייקטים ולכן אני מחליט שהסצנה הזאת היא סבירה או לא סבירה, או שאני בונה את הסצנה מלכתחילה ואני... כשאני מפענח כל אובייקט, אני כבר מפענח את האובייקט הזה על רקע הסצנה. כאילו יש לי תפיסה ראשונית של הסצנה, ואז אני מפענח את האובייקטים ספציפיים, ואז אני מפענח את האובייקטים ואז אני מפענח את האובייקטים. בדיוק. אז על ידי ERP וה-N400 אפשר היה להגיד, אוקיי, זה קורה בשלב כזה, הוא כל כך מוקדם, ב-220 מיליסקנד, אנחנו כבר רואים הבדלים, כן, בניתוח, שזה... באותו זמן שאנחנו יודעים שהם מפענחים אובייקטים, כן? זאת אומרת, זה לא אחרי שפענחתי את כל האובייקטים. 220 מילי סקנד אחרי שהראיתי את הסצנה, כבר יש לי הבדל בין סצנה שהיא קונגרנט ואינקונגרנט. זאת אומרת שהאינקונגרנט נכנס לאינטגרציה, היא כבר חלק מהעיבוד של האובייקטים, לא פוסט-חוק, זה לא קודם אני מפענח את האובייקטים, אז יש אינטגרציה. למשל, כאילו... זה קומפיוטיישנל, יותר מאשר להגיד משהו על בדיוק איפה זה קורה במוח או איזה מירון פועל מתי. כן. אני לגמרי מסכים, זאת אומרת, אני לא... אני רוצה להגן על זה, כי אני מלמד את זה, אני רוצה להגן על זה, אבל אני יותר בצד שלה. אני חושב שירפי זה כלי נהדר, אבל התרומה שלו היא יותר בסקציה חישובית מאשר בלהגיד משהו על אזור מסוים במוח. שפעיל או לא פעיל. אני לא חושב שזה פחות מעניין, אנחנו צריכים להבין איך ה-computational עובד, כן? אני אתן לך עוד דוגמא, אני בא לך. עשינו ניסוי שבו... יצאת מה זה LRP? יצאת על ה-Israelitis? אם את מסתכלת על הגולגולת מלמעלה, כן, ואת עכשיו הולכת להפעיל את יד שמאל, אז נגיד במאה מילי סקנד לפני שאת מפעילה את יד שמאל, זה נהיה ממש שלילי מעל המטרופוטקס מצד ימין. אז אם אני, ולהפך אם את מזיזה את יד ימין, אז אם אני מחסיר את האלקטרודה הזאת מהאלקטרודה הזאת, אני מקבל משהו שנקרא לאטר על ה-readiness potential. זה הזמן שלחצתי על הכפתור, אז אם לחצתי ביד ימין אני מקבל דבר כזה, ואם לחצתי ביד שמאל אני מקבל דבר כזה. ואם אני פשוט הופך את זה לצורך העניין, אז אני מקבל תמיד משהו כזה. זה הקונטרלטר על פחות המנהלת של הטר. אז עכשיו עשינו ניסוי שבו הראינו נזקים קוראים שהם לא ראו, הוא היה נמשך, הם לא ראו אותו. אמרו? אה, אין פעם נמשך? פעם נמשך, שיכול היה להיות חצי ימינה או חצי שמאלה או נמשך. ואז אחר כך, אחרי שהם ראו את הפעם הנמשך, הם ראו חצי ימינה או חצי שמאלה, שאמרו להם שזה חצי ימינה או חצי שמאלה. או שהם ראו סימן של פלוס שאמרו להם שיצאו באיזה יד שגרה. אז כמו שאת יכולה לצפות, הפריים עשה משהו, כן? זאת אומרת שבמקרים האלה... במקרים האלה, אם זה היה אותו פריים, הפריים היה תואם, אז זה היה יותר מהיר, ובמקרה הזה הם נטו יותר קצת ללחוץ לכיוון של הפריים ולא לכיוון ההפוך. עכשיו השאלה היא, מה את עושה בכלל כשאת רואה פלוס כזה ואומרת לך תחצי מה שאת רוצה? אין לך שום סיבה מיוחדת לצאת בעד ימין ועד שמאל, אז... 
יכולה להיות משותקת, כן? אני מבין, לא בעצם על המדיעת שמונה, אני מבין, איך אנחנו עכשיו בוחרת בגוף של קוקה קולה? אז זה יכול להיות, אבל אחרת אין לך שום סיבה, זאת אומרת, אוקיי, אז כנראה שמה שקורה זה שזה רנדום בורק, ואם אני במקרה הייתי יותר קרוב לסיבה, יש לי שני שופטים, כן? הייתי יותר קרוב לסיבה, אז כנראה שאני אזכר את זה, כן? נכון, אז הפריים צריך לדחוף אותך לאחד הכיוונים, נכון? אז יצאת מזה. אז בחלק מהמקרים אני באמת אצטרף את זה. מה קורה באחרים? מה קורה בתואר הזה אחרי? למה לא בכל המקרים שהצגנו את הפריים? זה דחף אותם ללחוץ בכיוון הזה. everything else being equal, הדבר, הפריים זה הדבר היחידי שקרה, היה יכול לגרור את הפריים. אז השאלה אם זה העניין, או שמה שקרה זה שהפריים השפיע ודחף אותם באמת לכיוון, ובכל זאת הם נבדקים באיזה דרך. שאולי זה בגלל רעש, דחפו את זה לכיוון השני, איך אני יכול לדעת? אז אני מסתכל על ה-LRP, אוקיי? ומסתבר שמה שקורה זה שאנחנו מסתכלים על ה-LRP. זאת אומרת, אם יכול להיות שהפריים בכלל לא השפיע? נכון, כי יכול להיות שזה מנוסח, את יודעת, לפעמים זה הצליח לעבור את האות ויז'ואל קורטקס, לפעמים לא, המסוך היה כל כך לא, שלא רעש שם. כן, אז אפקטים של הפריים תמיד חלשים, כן? אז מה שהסתכלנו, מה קורה במקרים שהם נבדקים, לוחצים... הלכו עם הפריים או הלכו נגד הפריים? רק במקרים של פרי צ'ויס. אז מה שאנחנו רואים זה שאם הם הלכו, אם זה היה נייטרלי בכלל, אז את רואה את ה... במקרה הזה, זה כאן הופיע הפריים, אוקיי? אז את רואה משהו כזה. אם לעומת זאת היה פריים, אני יודעת לך את זה בכיוון הנכון, נכון, אז זה מתחיל לרדת יותר מוקדם. לא מפתיע אולי, הפריים גרם לו להתחיל להתכונן כבר כאן, כן? אבל כשאני יודעת לך את זה בכיוון השלך, כנגד הפריים, אז אנחנו רואים דבר כזה. זאת אומרת שהפריים נכנס, עובד, הגיע עד המוטור קורטקס, כן? גרם לו להתכונן. מפני שהפריים היה בכיוון ההפוך. זה נקרא אינקונגרואנטי, זה המצב הנוטרלי, זה המצב הקונגרואנטי וזה המצב האינקונגרואנטי. אז אנחנו מזה אנחנו צריכים להסיק שהפריים היה אפקטיבי, הפעיל את המוטו קורטקס ואף על פי כן הנבדק לאיזשהו עשה אוברולינג לפריים הזה, ואז אפשר להתחיל לבנות מודל של איך זה קורה, רעש, לא רעש, כל מיני דברים כאלה, אבל את זה לא יכולנו לקבל, את המידע הזה לא יכולנו לקבל אלא על ידי הסתכלות על ERP. כן, אני חושבת שזה די התנהגותי. הסתכלתי על הפעילות המוחית, מה זה התנהגותי? לא למדתי שום דבר חדש על פעילות, לא למדתי שום דבר חדש על המוח, אני השתמשתי במוח. לא, לא, טוב. כן, זה מה שאתה רוצה להגיד? כן. אז אני מסכים איתך לגמרי. אני חושב שב-ERP בדרך כלל מה שאנחנו עושים זה שאנחנו משתמשים במוח כדי לעשות דברים כאלה. יש פה ושם ניסיונות שאת יכולה להתווכח איתם, אני הרבה פעמים מתווכח איתם, כן? שמנסים להגיד יותר מזה, כן? למשל, להראות שבמצבים של קונפליקט... אנחנו מפעילים את הסינגולי ספורט, את השיר סינגולי ספורט. רוב המידע על זה בא מ-ERP. מניסיונות למקם פעילות ב-ERP. אפשר להתווכח אם את מאמינה לזה, לא מאמינה לזה, אם יש קונברג'ינג אבידים שתומכים בזה או לא, אבל אפשר לנסות לעשות את זה, אבל זה החלקים החזקים יותר. כן, זה לא אני מסכים את כי זה לא נותן פריים שהוא חטא, אלא אתה עושה משהו. כאילו, זה נותן אור ועל זה. אקזוג'נס, זה נקרא אקזוג'נס קיו, אבל אתה נותן לי אקזוג'נס קיו. לא עשינו את זה, זה מעניין. אפשר להתחיל פה, נכון? רוצים להתחיל? אם יהיה אותם? כן, נקווה שנה הבאה. מה נשמע? הכל בסדר? מתאששים? טוב, דברים פתאום קורים, מה זה? זה קשה גם שזה פחות אפקטיבי, כן. בשבוע הבא ביקשנו מגבי לעוד לארצות, אבל אתה פטור מ... אה, לא יודעת. כן, כאילו לא חזרת אליי, אמרת לי שאמרנו שתחזור אליי ותגיד את זה, היית לך סוג, אז לא רציתי...
זהו, אז רציתי להעיק עליך ויש את כל הדברים האלה, אז אני חושב שאני אגע בי על זה. על סימוליישן. מה שהיה קצת, מה שאמור היה קצת. So, um, the next part of, of the talk will be um, an attempt to, sh- to, to show you a little bit how we quantify uh, ERPs. And, and to show you whether, whether especially whether the, uh, the, the things that we have to think about when we quantify ERP because there are many many um, points which are subtle um, that have to be, that we may, may need to make decisions about okay so I'm going to talk about uh, several, several things um, about averaging about uh, artifacts uh, about what we call what is what is the functional unit that we want to actually measure um, h- how we determine the baseline um, the reference the and some, a little bit about statistical inference. So I'm going to talk more about some of these and less about the others, simply because of, of time constraints. Um, and let's, let's, start, let's start with, with artifacts, okay? So um, we put electrodes on the skull. Okay? We try to measure neural activity in the brain. Unfortunately, together with the neural activity, our electrodes pick up any other electrical activity which is... In the na- happens to be in the neighborhood okay. and these um, interfere with our ability to measure what is really our focus of interest which is brain activity um, that I want to ma- make one point very uh, clear and it's not necessarily about ERPs but it's, def- it's, a, it's a general comment about, about artifacts that you need to know when you do um, anything that has to do with the measurement there are two types of artifacts One is problematic and the other is t- hori- horrific. Okay? So, and the, the, hori- the, one, the one that is really um, a problem and frightens us, worries us when we do research is if we have an artifact which is, um, syst- which is a systematic one. An artifact which is in some way locked to the same manipulation or the same events that we try to measure. Okay? Because those will mimic as if they are real things that we, and we, are, we might actually write a, na- a paper to nature and describe them. Okay? Uh, and the other artifacts which are kind of random and, ha- happen, and happen here and there, they will interfere with our ability to make to, to reach conclusions. And they also might lead us in the, in the wrong, to the wrong conclusion. But they're not as, as, uh, as uh, problematic or as, or as, uh, as um, risky as the locked, locked artifact. So the one important thing that you want to do in any experiment is to make sure that you're not measuring an artifact in the sense that you don't have something that, which is evoked by your stimuli or by your events. Uh, and I'm going to give you an, ex- an example later of this kind of a systematic artifact. So, but let's start with a general question of what causes the artifacts. Um, and these are, these are the, ba- the main sources of electri- electrical artifacts. The muscles that we have on the head and the neck are big sources of electrical activity. The eyes are a big source of electrical activity for three reasons. One is the um, corneal retinal dipole. It's an electrical dipole, electrical difference, p- potential difference between the cornea and the retina. This, this dipole uh, points forward usually and as you move the, your eyes it moves with your eyes okay right and left and therefore it will affect the electrodes differently as you move your eyes left and right and it's close to the electrodes and it's big and so it makes a big a big artifact so that's that's one of the sources the other thing is that the eyes have muscles that move them so again we have muscle muscle artifacts that we record when the eyes move and the third one is when we blink 
what happens when we blink is that the eyelid goes down over the eye, it touches, it touches the cornea, and since the cornea is, is charged, as I just said, it actually shortcuts the, this, this potential to the electrodes. So we get a big change in the electrodes close to the eyes when we blink, and it actually affects most of the electrodes that, we, that are on the skull. Okay? So, so blinks and this dipole and the muscles create artifacts when the eyes move. And this is one of the reasons that I told you that we actually have electrodes around the eyes so that we can measure when the eyes move. And even better, if we can have an eye tracker uh, at concomitantly with the, uh, with the EEG, we can, we can control for eye movements even better. Um, the, second w the, the third one here is the line noise, which is obvious. Uh, electrical uh, devices like the computer, sc the computer screen or the computer itself or fans um, el elicit uh, uh, electrical, uh, electrical fields, and those can be picked up, especially if there's a high resistance, high imp impedance between the electrodes and the skull, then this noise will be picked up uh, heavily. Um, other, uh, other sources of, uh, of uh, artifacts have to do with failures of sorts. So the amplifier may get saturated, so you can't get higher than some level, and then if you get higher than that, you just get a flat line. Hardly happens with modern, modern amplifiers, so that's not really a big, a big issue. And the other one is signal loss. Okay, so if there's breaks in your line, in your wires, or if the electrode gets disconnected from the scalp, you didn't put enough gel inside and so on, you might get artifacts in, in your signal. These are easy, easy to, de to detect. The, the, the first two ones are harder to detect and are actually a challenge. Okay? So this is what, that, what um, EEG looks like when you, when you run it. Okay? Um, and you can already see that the, the, you have these big spikes like this one, and this one, and this one. And these are, these are blinks. These are cases when the, when the subject blinks. Okay, so all of this is going to be really difficult to analyze because of these huge potentials relative to the small potentials that we want to measure. Okay? So what do we do about these ar about artifacts? We can either try to reduce them a priori, which is best. Okay, try to make our signals as clean as possible for instance, by instructing the subjects not to move the eyes or by giving them blink breaks when they can sort of refresh their eyes and not blink at the time when we want them not to blink um, or make them very relaxed so that they don't have too much tension in their muscles. Okay, so these are, these are really important things when you run the experiment. As they say, garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so if you collect bad, da bad data, it's going to be difficult to, to recover it. So this is what I call reduce. Then, once you already recorded the data and you have artifacts, you want to try to either discard parts of the data which have big artifacts, so you just mark them and say, this is bad, I'm not going to use it. That's a shame. You lost a lot of time and money and the, 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 subject the subject's time, so you try not to discard too much data, but many, in many cases there is no choice. And the, the last thing is to try to in some way mathematically remove or separate the real signal from, from the artifacts. Okay? And there are very w various way, ways to do it. I'll just give you a hint. Um, <coughs> does everybody know what ICA is? Independent Component Analysis? Anybody doesn't know? Okay, so um, I'll give you just, a, I won't explain ICA, of course, but I'll just give show well, just, just show this, this uh, slide for those who don't know or, or didn't think about it. Hmm? We have discussed ICA? Hmm. Okay, so let me just say that the idea is that we have sensors here in microphones, but we have EEG, okay? And there are many sources of activity here people speak. Every one of these uh, microphones records all of these people together. And by using a mathematical trick called independent component analysis, we try to uh, separate or regenerate the, the sources separately, each one separately. Okay? <coughs> and there are ways to do it if you have enough, if you have enough, if you have enough sensors or microphones relative to the number of people that you, uh, that you record. So that, that's, IC, that's ICA. And now um, let's go to, to the artifacts. 
Um, and I'm going to, to show you uh, muscle, muscle artifacts. So this is what the head looks like, and if you see this picture, it, you will always remember why we have so much problem with, with muscle artifacts. And the head is covered with, with muscles. The only place where we don't have muscles is here, at the very, very top. Okay. Um, to, just to illustrate how, how uh, difficult this issue is, especially when you look at higher frequencies in your data. So there's a crazy group in Australia uh, that uh, injected to themselves, to the, the researchers themselves, injected to themselves curare, which is, a, which is a drug that blocks your muscles. This is the thing that you get in, in surgery. So once you're anesthetized, they give you curare so that they can sort of open your, your abdomen and so the muscles are relaxed. But then, of course, you, they have to, to ventilate because your muscles... Your, um, your, your respiration muscles don't work as well. So <coughs> these crazy people <laughs> didn't anesthetize them, so they actually awake. They injected curare, except for the fact that they had a, this uh, um, block here so that the curare couldn't get to their fingers so they could press the button. Okay? And, and they, had, they, were, they were ventilated by, uh, by um, a kind of ventilator. Anyhow, they got, they got oxygen. They, they're alive still today. <laughs> And, but what you see here is the spectrum. So this is the, this is the frequency and this is the amplitude. And, which, and you see here, th and the spike is nothing important. This is the line noise, okay, the 50 hertz from their electrical, electrical devices. But what you can see is that all these high frequencies over here, above 40, drop down immediately when you, when you block the muscles, which means that most of the power that we have in EEG in these high frequencies comes from muscles, not from the brain. Okay? And, um, you can see here, this is the normal rest EEG, the power of, of, the, of the gamma range, 30 to 100 uh, hertz. You see that exactly where the muscles are, you see a lot of high frequency. And then when paralyzed, there is no power. Okay? So don't do it at home. <laughs> don't do it at all. Um, and if you, do, if you do do it, then let... Then let then <laughs> then let, let me know because I have some interesting experiments that I would like to run <laughs> while you do it, okay? Uh, anyhow, so... Um, Pardon? So... Wait, wait keep, keep this question, okay? Wait. So it's a bit... How... It's a big problem, okay? Um, so we want, but we want to get, we want to, we do want to record the high gamma activity. We, we do want to record activity in general, and the muscles are in our way. So we want to somehow try to remove as much as we can from this, from this data. So um, I'll, I'm skipping a few things, but th so we do the IC, this ICA trick, okay? We do the ICA trick. Each independent component is. Um, in, in, e in EEG, each independent component is characterized by a fixed scalp distribution. Okay, it has the same. It has one scalp distribution which changes in amplitude over time. Okay, so each each independent component has a topography, and it varies. This the amplitude of this topography varies over time. Okay, you can do the ICA either on time or on space, and here. This is, this is what we call independent component analysis. The idea is, or, the, the, or ideally, we would like to think that each of these components represents a source, either on the brain or outside the brain, but a, spa a spatial source. And since it's a spatial source, it always has the same, 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 same topography. But it can be either uh, weakly activated or highly activated over time. No, a component is a topography. Okay, so across all electrodes, it's a topography which may vary in intensity over time. So think about it as a source in the brain, which can be active or not or not active. And this topography, because of its orientation, this story, this source, because of its orientation and location in the brain, has some projection on the skull. So it's a pattern over all of the electrodes. Exactly, it's a pattern of o over all of the electrodes, which together become stronger or weaker over time. And so, 
the components can either be really things in the brain or they can be a muscle that is active or not active at some point. So what you see here is our different components and uh, the way um, we, we, did, we show it is that you see on top the topography from the top, from the back, and from the front. Okay? Here, so this is, this is the component, distribu component distribution. This is the raw time course of the component over, over time. This is the, po the, the power, the broadband power of this component over time. Okay? This is the spectrum of the, of, the, of the component data without time resolution, just the, the spectrum of the component data. Um, and over here what you see is different kind of time locking. So in this case, uh, this is uh, the, the da this data, but time locked and averaged to the blinks. Here, it's time-locked and averaged relative to saccades, to uh, rapid eye movements. Here, it's time-locked and averaged relative to the stimuli that's been presented. Okay? And down below, it's the same thing, but in time frequency. Okay? Now, this, for instance, is a blink component. Okay? We know that this is a blink component. You can see, for example, that when we time-lock it to the blink, you get a very nice clean comp component, but less so when we time when we lock it to other to other events. Okay? And you can also see the, the you can see the topography which is just above and below the eye. Okay? So this is the blink component. And the idea is sorry I'll stop this. <laughs> Okay, so, th so this was, a, this was a bl clearly a blink component. This is a component, this is a component which comes from the eye, so this is an ocular, ocular component, eye, mo eye movement, okay? So again, the topography is around the eye, and it's very, it's very sharp around, around, the around the saccade, okay? But, uh, but impo more importantly, I want to show you, um, yeah, show you... What do you mean it's sharp around yeah. the saccade? Only one no, um, there, w there were many saccades, but we averaged over all the saccades. Okay, we time locked the we, we time locked the 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 component we into segments around the saccades and then averaged them. Okay, and then you see this sharp potential over here. Um, the muscle, co the muscles. Okay, so. If you um, if you look at the if you look at the, at the spectrum of the mus of the muscle activity, you see that it has this um, long, very long and broad tail, okay, of, of, high, of frequencies from 20 hertz and all the way up. Okay, this is very different from a neural component, which has this kind of a what we call one over f response. So it gets smaller and smaller and smaller over over time. So just to compare, compare these two, if you just look at the component, it's pretty easy to say this is a muscle, this is not a muscle. Okay? And the, the importance of this is that it allows us to now take this component and remove it from the data. Okay? Because we can, recon we can, since we decompose the data into several components, we can reconstruct the data by recombining the components. But we can recombine the components excluding one, which we think is a source of noise. Okay? And that's the way we use ICA to remove uh, the blinks and sometimes ocular artifacts and sometimes uh, clear muscle artifacts. Um, so these are just examples of, of mu different muscles. You see, these are different muscles. You can see that all of them have this kind of a signature of, of, uh, of high frequency. Yeah. We do, we do all of these. So we look at, it, we look at it to, to try to. It's really a, a kind of an art to define uh, um, sources of, of noise with ICA. But to make it less of an art, we use both the distribution, and you see the distribution is very, very clear. It's very specific 
which is not very much like the, the neural components, which always will be broader. Okay? So it has a specific distribution, and it has this type of uh, broad, so we know that this is a, this is a muscle. Okay? Yeah. Doesn't that mean that you are assuming that muscles are They're independent of each, o- of each other to a, certain, to a certain extent, okay? And if they're not, then, we're, then we, it doesn't really matter as long as we remove the whole thing. So if we remove two muscles, and they're not completely independent, that's fine too. Not necessarily. Why? Like not. Well, yes. Well, I mean, I can move my this finger, and this finger will not move. Sometimes, sometimes. So then we will try to remove all of these muscle, all of these muscle artifacts, and even if, even if we didn't decompose them com- completely, it will still remove the noise. Now, what you're saying is is actually correct and even more serious than what you, the way you, you presented it, because. The, the real problem and the real risk and the reason we use it very, very carefully, these things, okay? And actually in my lab, we usually use ICA mainly to remove blinks which are so clear and so independent that we feel safe to remove them. But the, the real risk is that not that there is no independence between the muscles, but these, com- that these components include some neural activity. So they're not, that the muscle activity and the neural activity are, were not decomposed well, okay? Really, it's a matter of how many sensors you have, you have, and how distinct this was. So it's not clear that each of these components is a clean muscle artifact. So we do it; we have to do it very carefully. But this is this is the method, the main method that is used. Um, so I'm going to skip again some some examples. Um, Okay, so, so that, was, that was the ICA, but I'll give you, a, and come down now to Aviv's question, okay? So, it sounds like they're making mil- like shakes, food shakes, no? But they're actually vacuuming the floor. Maybe it's the time that makes me think of food. <laughs> okay, so this is an interest, a, nice, a nice story which is also strongly connected to ELSEC. So I'll, I'll tell you the story because it gives you the flavor of the problem of, of artifacts and um, what they can do. So many years ago, uh, Gray and Singer recorded from the cat's visual cortex, and they recorded from neurons, which uh, f- from from adjacent neurons, and they mapped their receptive fields. Okay. So here you see the receptive field of one neuron, and here the receptive field of the other neuron. And what you see below is the cross correlogram of the two neurons. So how correlated is their activity in time? And what they did was to pass a bar of light across the receptive field. And when they did that, when it was a long bar of, of light which crossed both receptive fields, they got a very nice pattern of correlation between these two, uh, two neurons at a, around a rate of 40 hertz, okay? So this is a, a, around a 40 hertz oscillation and the correlation of this oscillation between these two uh, neurons. And it was even more intriguing that when they broke the line and they were two independent lines and they moved them across these two receptive fields, they also got this nice cross, co- cross correlation. But when they took these two lines and moved them one in one direction and the other in the, uh, in the opposite direction so that it doesn't look like it's one line crossing the, crossing the two receptive fields, this correlation broke down. Okay. So it, um, it looked like, okay, so this is the way it was, this is either this way or that way. Okay, so it, so it, looked, it looks like uh, when you have something which is bound, like two objects which are bound, uh, they are bound by the fact that these two neurons synchronize their activity at a rate of about 40 hertz. And there have been several other studies that showed kind of the, kind of the same thing. If you look, I didn't bring this slide, but if you look at, the, at the every single new, every one of these neurons separately, you see that they do have this oscillation of their LFP around 40 hertz. And this shows you that not only do they have this oscillation, but they synchronize their oscillations. So it's a really nice way of binding 
across different locations in space, right? The neurons sync together and that, therefore they know that they belong to the same object. Binding being one of the most important questions of, of, of cognitive, uh, cognitive science. So that made a lot of, a lot of um, uh, impact uh, in, in the field and still does. But then, uh, like 10 years later, um, this group of, of researchers uh, in, in France said, well, let's see if we can find evidence of this kind of binding using EEG. Okay? And they presented this study that I already showed you where they had this uh, Kanita triangles or, or rotated Pac-Man. And you know, lo and behold, when they did that, and they did the time frequency analysis that we, that we discussed already, they found that indeed, this around 40 hertz, you get an increase in the power of gamma, around 300 milliseconds after the, the stimulus is presented, when you actually have this binding, when you have a coherent triangle formed between the Kanitsa, tri between the Pekman, but not when you don't have this Kanitsa triangle formed. Okay, so this looks like a really nice analog recorded from the scalp to the finding of grain singer in the cat and in the monkey. And several other, other groups went, be, went after this, kind, this uh, um, gamma activity and for instance showed that it's, it, the gamma activity is stronger. You see here just the power of gamma over time. So you see it gets stronger when you see a coherent object but not when you take the very same, same object and, switch and just um, distort it using Photoshop. So it's the same color, it's the same contrast, and so on. O the only thing is that in one there is a coherent object, and in the other there is no coherent object. Okay. Now, <coughs> one thing I have to mention that I kind of skipped in the other presentation for the sake of time, but it will become material, is that the way these time frequency plots are formed <coughs> is by uh, calculating the time frequency spectro spectrogram of each trial and then averaging all these spectrograms, okay? So the phase information is lost, okay? So we see just the power over time, over frequencies, averaged acro across, tr across um, <coughs> trials. And that will become important. <coughs> That's called, the name is induced activity rather than evoked activity. Yeah. Uh, did someone try, I mean, check that what's going on in the brain? I mean, like as you showed. That's what we were trying to do. We yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> So in, the, in, in, my, in, in animals, definitely. So there are groups which are, looking, which are investigating this kind of, an os of oscillations, from Pascal Singer and then Pascal Fries, who was his student and now runs an institute in Frankfurt. Um, they definitely, this is one of the, of, of the most important things that they do. They try to figure out what are the mechanisms that create these oscillations and how these, uh, how these uh, synchronizations are formed and in which frequencies. What do they find? Yeah. Not now. Okay. So we're trying talking about methods. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I don't really understand the um, difference between induced and evoked. Ah, uh, I try to. I try to. Uh, <laughs> let's get into it. I'll say it in one sentence, and if, if, if it's not here, I'll explain it later if you want. But you can either first average all the trials, and then do this time frequency analysis. That's called evoked. Okay or you can first do the time frequency analysis on every trial and then average over those. So that's the, that's the difference between evoked and induced. The thing, the, when, when you do the evoked uh, type of activity, if the, if, the power, if the oscillations are not in phase with each other from trial to trial, they will... Okay. <laughs> I'll show this slide. the other presentation. Okay. 
So, imagine, imagine this, uh, these situations. Um, so, it's Im pay attention because I didn't, I skipped it not because it's not important, but uh, I just had to decide what. So, since we're doing it, let's let's concentrate for a second. So, imagine you have this kind. These are, these are different trials: one, first trial, second trial, third trial, fourth, and so on. Okay, you could have any. So in at some points in the tr these trials, there is an increase in the power of this oscillation, whatever its uh, frequency is, okay? Now, in one situation, in one situation, in the, forget about the analysis, in one situation in the brain, it could be that the phase of this oscillation is always the same. So, say, uh, here we presented the stimulus, and exactly at this point, the oscillation starts, and it starts always at the same phase. So, from trial to trial, you see the exactly the same oscillation with the same phase, okay? Another situation could be that Sometime after the stimulus, there is an increase in the power of the same type of oscillation, but from trial to trial, the phase is not consistent. Okay? Sometimes it starts at this phase, and sometimes at this phase, and sometimes at this phase. So either it's jittering in time or jittering in phase, it's the same thing, basically. But over the, over the trials, the <coughs> phases do not synchronize. They're not coherent. Now, what will happen if I ju now just simply average those trials? Okay? If, I, if I do this, if I average, the evoked activity is going to, to, keep to, to stay high, right? Because the phases are, are synchronized. But if I, if I average across the, what I call induced activity, phase jittered activity, then even though every single trial had increased power, the, the average will show small, low power, right? Because, because the phases cancel each other from trial to trial, okay? So to get around this, to get around this, to be able to recover this and not this, the way, the way to do it is to take these single trials, not average them like here, okay? but first ca calculate the time frequency, um, uh, time frequency uh, spectrogram from each trial, okay? and then average those to get one average uh, time frequency map. And the reason this works is because pictorially, the way I just described it, and more mathematically, the reason is that when, you do, when I show you this, there is no phase anymore. You know, the decomposition separates the, the phase from the power. I don't look at the phase anymore. I just look at the power, and therefore, I can get this uh, type of math. Okay? So that's called induced response, and the, the other one is called evoked response. And you can think about, about it either as an analytic process, where you, um, when you measure, where you measure the induced response or the evoked response, but also as two types of activities in the brain, which can be ones with inter high inter-trial coherence or low inter-trial coherence. Okay. Um, can yeah. I'm not sure what do you mean by what do you mean by lock to each other? So it depends on what is your what is your time res temporal resolution, right? So if if the activity is the jitter is so big, okay, that you might say, I'm not sure I'm measuring the same thing, you know, why, why would you call something that happens at 200 milliseconds and at 400 milliseconds in different trials, why would you call it the same thing and, and, and try to measure it together? So that's a question that you have to ask yourself when you do the analysis, you know, what is your temporal resolution, uh, what is your reasonable temporal resolution? Which would take a window and see yeah, and so you have to figure out you, what, it, what, what type of jitter you're allowing. Okay, in this ana in this analysis. Um, okay, so so that was just to explain the the method. Um, and now the the story con the story continues um, that. Once, once we did the same kind of experiments in my lab, and we even uh, 
show that not only is that it's coherent object versus incoherent object, but also when you present it, for instance, a cat with uh, with a bark or a cat with a meow, you get different different responses. But then people, clever people in ELSE commented that this kind of response looks to looks to them more like a spike than an oscillation. Okay, and so we went on to to figure out what what exactly could could be happening, and we found that when we look at the eye movement. We look at saccades after the stimulus. We see that after the presentation of the stimulus at time zero, there is a reduction in the probability of saccades, and then an increase in the probability of saccades later. Okay. Hmm? This is the sac- this is saccades, quick moving, ah, yeah, very small, sac- very small saccades, hmm? miniature saccades. And uh, so uh, this is, and then when we looked at the peaks at, at, the sp- at spikes in the EEG we saw that they have the same kind of pattern okay? and if we just look at the histogram of the saccades here and we just shift it to this histogram of the, of the peaks it's exactly the same and if you take another subject you see the, you see the, same, you, the same thing and another subject which doesn't have so much increase in saccades after this break they also don't, don't have an increase in the spikes in the EEG so all this together led to the conclusion that these spikes, which create this high, fre- high frequency activity, are actually saccades. Okay? They're not neural. Act- they're not. They are not neural activity. Why? Why? Because if you look, this is the EEG. This is this is the eye position. So the eyes are here, and then they move to this point, and then they move to this point. Okay. And every time the eye moves, we see a spike in the EEG. Okay? And when we translate this to the, ti- to, the temp- to the frequency domain, it creates this large blob of broadband, ac- broadband activity. This is because of the nature of the, f- of the frequency transformation. That's the way it is. Sharp spikes create broadband, acti- broadband power. Okay, so, so th- after having discovered that, why do we see this kind of a gamma activity together with, with a coherent object, with Kanitsa triangles and, s- and so on? Uh, the reason is one is that many people have shown before that when you try to fixate on something, your eyes occasionally <coughs> make these micro saccades. But once an event happens, you stop making these micro saccades, and then you increase your micro saccades. We showed that every every uh, every micro saccade creates a spike in the spike in the EEG. Each spike creates this blob of activity in the power spec in the power time time frequency domain. And if you average over these you get exactly the response that we saw before. Okay, so in fact, what looked like a, res- a, a, a neural response that had to do with coherent object is actually more eye movements for coherent objects. Okay, so there, it, it turned out that some objects elicit more of these uh, saccades than others. So this is an example for a systematic artifact. Okay, something which is, has to do with your manipulation and is why it was missed for, for so long by others and by us, okay? Um, Can I ask something? If you have to, only if you have to. Okay, so then otherwise ask me later because I'm actually going to miss the ma- main part of my talk today. <laughs> okay, so what I, wanted, what I want to, to finish with is to say a few words about what exactly do we want to, to measure? From the, from the ERP, which is not trivial. And there are two cases I want to make. One is when you know what you're, tr- what you're looking for, so you have an a priori hypothesis. And the other one is when you don't have an a priori hypothesis, you're just, you just want to see what happens. I mean, I did this manipulation, what's going to happen to the, to the ERPs? Okay. So these are, these are generally the two types of analysis that you may want to do. Um, and the first case is when you, when you know uh, what you want to do. And then um, you have some kind of an ROI, region of interest. And the region of interest in our case would be defined in time. So when a long time is the region of interest, where on the scalp is my region of interest, and also um, what, what is its morphology. What, is the waveform, what does the waveform look like? Or in other words, what is the frequency, uh, the fre- frequency spectrum of this event that I'm looking for. So I, I, I need to define my, my a priori hypothesis relative to some known phenomena which is well char- characterized, okay? Um, so I just showed you like half an hour ago 
several of these kind of ROIs. I may want to measure the P3 or the mismatch negativity or the N170, and I know where it's supposed to be and what, when in time it's supposed to be and what it should be looking like, and then I want to measure it and see how I mani my manipulation uh, actually affected the, this component. Okay? Now, I get these ERPs, okay? and I know that I wanted to measure, to measure this, suppose it, let's say it's the mismatch negativity. Okay? I know that it's this negativity between 100 and 300 milliseconds that I want to measure. But what do I measure exactly? So I may want to measure the amplitude of this response. Okay? But then the question is, amplitude relative to what? Okay? So usually uh, we do it relative to some resting baseline or some passive baseline before the stimulus happens. But it's not always the good choice. And it's just, I'm saying it so that you think what is the baseline against which you want to measure your amplitude. The other thing is, I re remember that we have reference electrodes, okay? And we have a reference electrode and it really it makes a difference what was the, my reference when I recorded the data because that will determine the amplitude that I measure at any given electrode. So these two have to be taken in consideration, okay? Then, um, the question is, what is what amplitude of what? I mean, am I going to measure the peak of this and the peak of this? Am I going to average some window of time around some peak or around some a priori determined time? All of these are options that people use, okay? But they have to be determined and better determined uh, a priori, okay? Um, then the other thing that I may want to, to measure is the latency of the component. So in some cases, the manipulation is not going to ma change so much the amplitude of the response, but whether it comes late or, or early. Okay? So I want to measure the latency, and then again, I have many things that I could want to measure. I may want to measure the latency of 